should Well, you could bump me. I, I just want to make sure they can hear me online, especially. Otherwise, I'll just be like that. Today's a day for eating, right? Dressing up. I don't look any different. Sorry. Day for barbecues. Day for... Oh, yeah, and, and you know... This keeps going in and out. I don't know why. I'm sure, I'm sure it's Isaac's fault somehow, some way. <laughs> but in the world looks at this as just another, right? I mean, they'll attribute it to something as long as it has to do with rabbits or, you know, some eggs and whatever. And they'll listen, perhaps, to the real reason for this holiday. But sadly, so often, even in church, you don't hear the real thing. Oh, oh, is it online? Okay, all right. Okay, that'll be fun. All right. Then take this off. Oh, wait, no, it's all straight. I'll turn it off, though. Now is it on? Okay. All right, hopefully it'll pick me up okay. Um, so... But uh, now I can't walk around. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know, but then I do one of these things. So <laughs> I, could, I, could, I could tape this to my cheek and just with duct tape. But, um, but even when people go to church that once a year, a couple times a year, usually at, at Christmas time or Easter time, it's about, yeah, give me what I hear every year. Let me come in. You got about 20 minutes because we got to hit the restaurant before it's too full. At least this was what I've noticed in, you know, my 50 plus years of life. And the sad thing is they miss the real meaning of life. They miss the very thing that they don't even realize that they seek. And that is relationship with Jesus Christ. We talk about that all the time. I do want to go through the resurrection, but as usual, it's going to be a little different than probably a normal take on it. And I don't mean like a different resurrection. That's not what I mean. I mean a little bit different focus that perhaps much of the bride misses, and much of the bride does not pay attention to. So before we do, let's pray. And I know Josh already prayed this, but I want to pray it as well, just in agreement with him. Father, we worship you, we praise you, we trust you, and we seek you. Above all else, Lord, we seek you, and we desire to hear from you not from any one of us, because you are the one that have the words to life and life more abundantly. Not just 
are eternal life. But you have the words to life right here, right now, in relationship with you. You have it, Father. We desire it. We seek it. And you have promised that we'll find it when we seek it. We find you when we seek you. So that's what I ask this morning, that you speak through me according to your will and your will only. Lord, reveal even to those who are here, to those who are online, open up your word to reveal new layers of what you have. We can never dig to the depth that would exhaust your word, ever. So there are still layers that have not been found, perhaps, that have not been understood, certainly, that can only be understood by seeking you, by inviting your Holy Spirit to lay on our hearts what you are saying in these moments and in your scripture. So, Father, as we dig, just give us those gems. And, and I don't pray this just for this morning. I don't pray it just for myself. I pray it for all those here. I pray it for all those listening online and that will be listening to the podcast. I pray for all of us for this morning, yes, but every single day this week. Father, as we open your scripture, I pray that you send your Holy Spirit to interpret, to reveal, to show us your gems. We thank you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to Luke. And uh, Luke chapter 24, and this is, this is the resurrection. It, obviously, we know everything that led up to this. We know, we know the crucifixion, and, and uh, um, we know the price that he paid on the cross. And then he was in the tomb for three days. This is at the end of those days, starting at verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them, the apostles, an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter ran uh, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he, he went out. He went home, marveling at what he had hap at what had happened. I want to reread verse eleven. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Wow, what a, what a difficult thing to have to have written in all of history about you. That when confronted with the very thing that became fact, that had been prophesied over and over and over again, not just by Jesus for those three years, 
but literally prophesied for thousands of years. And in your moment of belief, you didn't. I want to keep reading because the same thing kind of happened moments later. It was on the road to Emmaus. Let's keep reading. And I'm, I'm just going to read this whole story here. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. By the way, it said, it recognized there's no time lapse here. It said that very day, that very day, that exact day. Two of them were going to, to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And this was after the resurrection and he had been in the grave for, for the, the three days. And then he was found that, oh, he's not there anymore, but we don't believe. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went in with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things you, that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? Jesus said to them. And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Let me read that again. But we had hoped that he was the one that would redeem Israel. In other words, that would be the Messiah. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, this Jesus saying to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In other words, he took them through the entire law, the entire Old Testament, pro prophetically of the coming Messiah, and laid it all out to them. So they drew near the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far, now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? It doesn't go into a lot of detail here in really recognizing why they didn't believe, why they didn't recognize him. Now, keep in mind that he is still in his earthly body, right? He is not glorified yet. His body was not yet glorified. That's what he said to Mary, don't, don't hang on me because I'm not yet glorified. My body is not yet glorified. So, so I would imagine, this is conjecture obviously on my part, but I would imagine that his body was the same as it was when it was taken off the cross, except cleaned up. So he had all the scars of the crown being forced onto his head. He had the scars of his beard being ripped out. Okay, so you can imagine 
they're probably going it, to, it's, it's not real hard to imagine that it would be hard to recognize him from somebody that you've been walking around with for three years, right? But yet they're talking about this fact that this whole time he's been talking to us and, and that there's, there's something that was burning inside and we couldn't really put a finger on it, what that was. Because there's a key that opens that. And that key is faith. And, key, and the faith of believing is a power that he gives us to connect with him. To understand him. To know him in relationship. Let's go back just a few verses before the road to Emmaus. Because I want to read again where it says, in verse 6 of chapter 24, he is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day to rise. And they remembered his words. We're in a different position today. Right? We're not before I'm going to try this. We're not before the crucifixion and resurrection. We're after the crucifixion and resurrection. So do we hold the same responsibility that they did before? Because, see, we can see it as a historical fact, right? That they couldn't see at that time. They could just see prophetically what was supposed to happen, so they were responsible for it. Jesus even said, you have no faith. Oh, the foolishness of your faith. And he told them. And then they remembered that he had told them. And then the, the two going to Emmaus, he took scripture and told them and showed them, laid it out, that God had told all this beforehand. But you didn't believe. See, it's one thing to say that you believe something. It's another thing to believe it in your heart. To know it as truth in your heart. Very different. This is the result of that difference. When something is ingrained in your heart and you know it to be true, then when the signs of it coming are happening, it's that confirmation to you. You would know it. It's not a surprise. Like this was a surprise to them. And it shouldn't have been. That's literally what Jesus said to them. It should not have been a surprise. Well, we find ourselves in a similar position, just with a different prophecy. We find ourselves in the position of historically looking at the resurrection, you know, the crucifixion and resurrection, but still prophetically looking at what his purpose was for that. And probably in most churches, or at least most Christian churches, it's being pre preached that Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by him. It is by accepting Jesus Christ into your heart that salvation is given. That, that eternity in heaven is promised and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. But the problem is, it's always expected it to go much further than that. You know what bugs me? I don't know why. 2,000 years the church has been around. 2,000 years. And yet except for the first, I don't know, 100 years or whatever it was, there was no real manifestation of his power on a full church scale. There's been revivals. There's been pockets of manifestation of his power, but not in the global church. Now, there's many reasons for that. Satan came against it right away. Because the last thing he wanted was a church to have a voice. Last thing he wants is, 
us to trust the Holy Spirit to actually speak and to actually build relationship with us, right? That's the last thing he wants, so he starts to attack it. My question is this. We know Jesus is resurrected. We know what he paid for. When will the church be resurrected? Because I'll tell you what, the church did die. It died a long time ago. It is only found active in pockets. Because if you look at it in the truth of relationship with Jesus Christ, then you have to understand that the vast majority of the church is dead. Because all it does is preach. Here, just believe in what Jesus did on the cross. You could be saved, accept him as Savior. And then, you know, go, go live your life. Because when, once your life's done, then you get this heaven thing. And I don't mean to minimal, minimalize that. Because I'll tell you what, the alternative would be hell. <laughs> Specifically and metaphorically. But there's so much more. There's so much more that the church, the global church doesn't know. There's so much more that is expected. There's so much more that Jesus said. That's why he said, when I return a second time, will there be faith in the land? Why do you think he said that? Because there wasn't faith the first time. When he came back, he's like, I've been telling you guys this. You should know this. Now, praise God, it's not about con con condemnation. It's not about, oh, forget it, and I'm just going to go up to heaven now. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He loves us. But that's why he said, will there be faith on the earth when I return? And yes, Yes, there will be faith because the bride is awakening. The bride is beginning to understand this on a larger scale. Outside of just the little... And that's what the Lord is stirring up right now because he is, he's put this dividing line out there and saying no longer can you be in the middle, no longer can you just believe in this get your salvation, and then live your life how you want to live it. Because I gave everything for you, Jesus said, you have to give everything for me. That's how relationship grows. When you, when you go to, I, I don't know, marriage counseling or, or you know, premarital counseling or you hear a marriage class or whatever, what do they say? Well, you know, if you put in 50% and they put in 50%, you got 100%. No, that's baloney. They'll all tell you, you've got to put in 100%, you've got to put in 100%, and together, then you're putting in everything. You're leaving everything right there between the two of you. Why is it any different with Jesus? It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be, he already gave his 100%. He's already there for us no matter what. Offering us more than just life. He said, life more abundantly. So it's up to us. It's up to us to give our 100% to him. Will he find believers with faith when he comes back. You know, as I was reading that, by the way, this thing's driving me nuts. I feel like, like in the camera, it looks like I, I have a microphone with a microphone. <laughs> and it, it'll just bug me when I look back at it. The way we gotta get this fixed. That'll bug me too. So, anyways, thank you. Thank you, Lord. When I was talking to him this morning, he took me to a passage. And actually, we could go, let's go back there. It's in Luke also, but 
it's at the beginning, Luke chapter 4. This was just when Jesus was beginning his ministry. And where he started was in his own hometown. And we know the whole story about a prophet is not accepted in his own hometown and, and all that. That's not the point of what I'm bringing out here. But I want to begin reading at verse 16. Jesus, as he always did, he goes into the synagogue to read, right? And, and to be there and absorb and to worship. So verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He didn't go pick it out. It was given to him, okay? He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, what I'm about to read, verse 18. The Spirit, and this Jesus proclaiming this in the synagogue, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of all the, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, "Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing." Now we're not going to go on, but if you were to go on there, you would recognize that what he did was he drew a line in the sand, and he said, "Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing." In other words, you've heard it. You're accountable, like we talked about last week. You're responsible for what you hear. Because today, this has become true. This scripture has now been fulfilled. The interesting thing is, that's not the entire paragraph of that scripture. And I want to turn to it. So, because this scripture is out, out of... Isaiah chapter 61, I want you to turn there. Because what the Lord was doing here was what he had said. He came to set the captives free. What is that? Freedom from sin. Now recognize, because we talk about him going to free the captives when he was three days in the grave, right? Because it wasn't just that. What he paid for was setting all of them free in the Old Testament that were still bound by death, that were still in Abraham's bosom. They weren't in heaven. They were in Abraham's bosom, right? They were certainly protected, and they, were, they, were, uh, you know, they weren't in hell or anything like that. And by the way, they weren't in purgatory either. There's no such. That's where the idea of purgatory comes from, which is incorrect. You can't pray people out of purgatory if you die now and you are saved, you don't go to Abraham's bosom, right? That's, that's non-existent anymore because Jesus freed the captives. He freed those that were bound by death, okay? And what he did in his life, in his preaching, in his payment of a perfect life, was he paid for that, and that's why he set down the scroll, because that was his job up to that point. But he didn't finish the scripture, and I want to finish it. So let, let's just read it again from the verse 1 of, uh, of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's where he stopped. But this is what goes on. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. 
to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And it goes on to literally express the readying of the bride. It goes on to express what relationship with Jesus Christ is and looks like on a global church scale. See, you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ now, and you can have this intimacy with him, and yet the world is still chaotic. The world, you know, clearly Satan has a lot of control in this world, or at least what, what goes on in our eyes, right? Ultimately, Satan has no control. We know that. That's not what I'm talking about. There are bad things that happen in the world. But when this global church, when the bride gets this, as the bride increases in relationship with him all over the world, what happens? It's what Isaiah 61 talks about. In the verses we just read, it literally is the salvation of the world and not salvation in terms of going to heaven. That's, I'm, I'm talking about saving from the evil one, from the evils that go on in this world. We see all the time, just turn on your TV, when the global, as the global church rises as the remnant rise, though, and I don't mean just by some name. You know, we're going to have this religious name and we're going to become big. No, that's not what we're talking about. They already tried. In fact, it splintered and now you have many different denominations you have in Christianity that believe in salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those who are in relationship with Jesus Christ that are growing all throughout the world. It's going to have a significant effect on the earth. It's going to have a significant effect in everything that we see here. Have a significant effect on our politics. Which would make sense if, as Jesus starts in the, through the Holy Spirit, starts placing remnant people, those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ in places of authority all throughout the world, it is going to make this world different. That's what he's talking about in the second part of this. In the second part of this where he says, and that day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. In other words, there comes a day, and Jesus didn't say it back when he was in Nazareth because that wasn't what he was there to accomplish yet. By the way, guys, that is in partnership with us. Jesus is not just coming to fix everything because, well, it's, it's on the calendar for this date, and okay, I'm just going to go fix everything now. This was available to us 2,000 years ago. This was available to us in believing through relationship with him, letting him do all the things that he has promised us that he would do. I mean, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look at, at some of the eschatology in prophetically in the future. Look at the, the seventh trumpet. If you just look at that, it's going to explain 80% to you. This is not a kingdom thing. This is not something that, well, will happen in heaven. No, the seventh trumpet is something that happens here in the natural, in the, what we would consider the natural world. And if you read the seventh trumpet, but it's also called the third woe. By the way, the, the woes are against the enemy. It's not woe against Christians. So don't look at the woe as a bang from our perspective. A woe is a good thing from our perspective. Just read the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet, and you see the bride does rule. Not, not rule on her own. 
not rule through selfishness, but rule. Jesus Christ is literally ruling through his bride. Righteousness will, come, will be at that point. That's why Jesus didn't, that's why he stopped when he was reading that in the synagogue. Because that part is also up to you and me. That part was what he always intended to do in relationship with his bride. That's why he was so, I don't want to say surprised, but like, really? I've been telling you this this whole time and you didn't believe me? If he were standing here right now, could he, have, could he say that of you? Could he say that of me? Could he say that of, the, of his bride? Look, I've had this laid out for 2,000 years. How is it that you wouldn't believe it? Is it because you haven't read it? Is it because maybe you think that that's up to me, Jesus, I mean? That we don't play a part in that? I don't know what the answers would be if he were to have come back right now. Because I would dare say on a global scale right now he would not find faith. He would find it in pockets, and that's how it's been for 2,000 years. But guys, we're, we're intended to be part of something bigger. We're not supposed to just be worried about our careers. We're not just supposed to be worried about our earthly relationships. We're not supposed to be just worried about our own lives. And I know I'm preaching the choir here. We're to be sold out. We're to be willing to do anything that he tells us to do. Anything. No matter what. That's what faith is. Will he find faith in us? My answer is yes. Yes. Because he has called the bride to this rulership. Before he comes, go read the third woe, the seventh trumpet. It says at the end of the seventh trumpet, when that seventh trumpet sounds, Jesus will come and meet his bride in the clouds. Right? That's what we call the rapture. By the way, I, the Lord has laid on my heart, and I'm, I'm going to be doing it. I don't know when. Ho hopefully pretty soon. I am going to be doing a series and this is kind of cool that I get to actually plan it. But a, a, a series on eschatology, a series on events, prophetic events and, and what they look like. Because I think we need to get a handle on, on what that is and what's expected. But in truth, as you build relationship with him, he tells you what's expected. Because he opens up his scripture and makes it come alive. You know, if you believe that, that the scripture, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, right? It literally means that it's God breathed, right? If you believe that, which I know we do, we certainly all say we do, but if you believe that, then you have to dive into this and treat this like you are consuming what God has to say. Not, oh, I've read this a thousand times, so you know I probably don't need to read that one again. There are so many layers to what God is saying to us. So many layers that we have to ingest this all the time. I forgot I wrote this down when I during worship. Yeah, that's controversial. <laughs> yeah. When we look at Easter time, just don't let it be another time of 
well, I, I'll just I'll focus on the Lord today and and just believe him for all the things that I'll have in heaven. And, and again, I know I'm not speaking necessarily to the people here. Start looking at him and building relationship with him and recognizing what he has for you right here, right now. We are not supposed to be a defeated people. We are not supposed to be a people that shy away from a fight. And I'm talking about even politically. We're not to shy away from a political fight. In fact, we're supposed to be involved. We're supposed to be leading. How can you lead if you're not even involved? In every bit of life, that's what he was talking about, or that, that's what was said after Jesus had stopped reading in the synagogue. Well, guess what? If he were standing here now, he'd, he'd be reading it and say, yeah, guys, you know, this is, this is now what's happening. This is available to you now where he wants to come and rule through his bride by faith because faith is what pleases him. What will he find when he comes? What will he find in you when he comes? What will he find in me when he comes? Will he find a willingness to do anything? You know, Jesus, we had a prayer vigil Friday night uh, that was went to midnight, and it was so good. Jesus did speak to us and, and manifested after the 11th hour, and he said something that was really cool. I mean, much like a lot of the things that he says, it's, it's kind of like you, you have to uh, certainly believe by faith and, and kind of wait to recognize exactly what it means. But what he said is in the next two weeks, I'm going to catapult ignition forward. Don't know what that means, but I do know the next statement that he said. He said, I would tell you to be ready, but you're already ready. So I, I want to encourage you guys in this because here in this church, I, I can't speak for anything online. I could speak for those in Nigeria, but here in this church, we do give him our yes. And, and not just as a church or church leadership, I'm talking about the body, the body of this church. I'm thankful for you guys because I've never met more hungry people. I've never met more hungry people, not just for things to get better, but for Jesus to move regardless of what that looks like. That is what he wants. That's the faith that he wants. When we step forward in this faith, it's going to cost. It has cost. I mean, it wasn't easy to be there Friday night, right? There were moments of, like, really tired. There were moments of, well, we're just waiting and we're not sure what to do next because we had no agenda. It was whatever the Lord wanted. But it is still about faith. It is still about all we needed to know is he told us to be there. All we need to know is that he told us to be still till he tells us something different. That's where we're at as a church right now. I know, I know we're doing these transitions and, you know, trying to figure out all this stuff and maybe online you, you see the lights coming from up here now and not down here. <laughs> Right? We're, we're, we're transitioning some things, but there's so much more going on than that. There's so much going on that God is moving and preparing and doing. And if you can imagine he's doing it with us, 
there are thousands of pockets all over the globe of remnant people that he's doing them with, this, this same thing with. And what's going to end up happening is he's going to start connecting them. So don't, don't think that, that even when we talk about remnant, those in relationship with Jesus Christ, don't think this is a small group. I mean, it might be small in comparison to the numbers in the world, but it's huge compared to numbers that they've needed for God to move in the Old Testament. And they're all over the globe, and he is working through all these pockets just like he's working in this church to bring something forward that has never been brought forward before. Not something that we can read just from our mind and understand, and okay, well, if we do these things this way, then this will be the result. No. First of all, that's not what relationship with Christ is. Relationship with Christ is absorbing his word, building relationship with him so you hear his voice and saying, I will do whatever you tell me to do, and then he tells you to do something. Now, he may, and we see this in this church body right here where he might tell one person to do something one person to do something else totally separate but all of a sudden they come together and it works perfectly why because the designer was God God said this part needs to do this this part needs to do this and I'll bring them together and it'll prove out the function that I need it to do Look at that on a global scale. That's what God is doing on a global scale. That's what he is doing with the entire body of Christ that are hot for him. Revelation 3, those who are hot, not those who are cold, not those who are lukewarm. That's why they need to be out of the way. That's why he is separating them out. Because the, the team has to function on the same level. Now, we all here have a purpose and a responsibility in our part to do what the Lord is teaching us to do. Whatever is he is telling us to do individually and corporately as Ignition, as this church body, we have a purpose in that. And we have to move forward in that. But we have a responsibility to that over everything else in our lives. No matter what, no matter what it is, no matter if it's a career, other relationships, family, it doesn't matter. Our responsibility is him. And look at what it can change. You know, we've just been a few weeks now out of the house, right? Imagine, well, I'll say this, These, this past week I've had a few visions of this. I'm not, not exactly sure how it works, but, but we, one of the visions, we were in a parking lot, and I don't even remember seeing a building. It was like out in the middle of nowhere in this parking lot, and we just pulled in. I don't know if we got permission to pull in or what we did. I, like, I don't know the details of the vision. I just know we pulled in, we set up, and we started having church. Nobody was there. Like, we, we didn't even tell people we were coming there. We just pulled up, we found the space, we set up, and we started to worship. And then people started one by one to come. And then they came, and people were prayed over, people were healed. And they started to come in droves. And in this vision, it got so big, they were very upset with us. Apparently, it wasn't our land. And we had to leave. And so we went, and we left. And we found another space. And the next one was in a field. And we set up. And then we just started to worship. And people came. I don't know what that looks like in the future for us. I just know that God is doing something significant. It is to reach people. This isn't just the responsibility of the leadership here. 
<laughs> I've told you before, if you're here, guess what? Your leadership. This is all of our responsibility. When you're out at the Wawa, and if you're not constantly talking to the Lord and in relationship with him, how will you know if he wants you to go up and talk to that person getting gas or talk to the, the person the, the, at the, behind the counter or whatever? How would you know if you're not listening to him? But yet those people may be the very connections that he is starting to bring. Right? So I, I want to encourage you today, of, of all days probably, two days of the year, Easter time and Christmas time are probably the easiest times of the year to talk to people about Christ. Because everybody kind of expects it. But you know what? When you talk to them, talk to them about friendship. Talk to them about love. Not about a God who could fix all your problems. We know he can do that. But yet, that isn't what relationship with him is about. I mean, if it, if it is, then he really owes an apology to his apostles because all them had problems and then they were killed, except for John, I suppose. So it wasn't about fixing problems. It was about an intimacy of relationship with your creator. Like he's right there. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to talk to him. It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way. So I encourage you guys, as you go out today and you go home, go out to eat, whatever you do, ask the Lord, what do you have for me? What do you want me to do today? Do you want me just to focus internally on family and, you know, we got a family thing going on, and which maybe he does. And if he does, then do it but be open to anything that he is leading in. It's also not about kind of the opposite end. It's not about, well, let me go and do this list of all these things that I can do my God thing today. You know, and if I do these 10 things, then I'm, I'm a good Christian. It's not about that either. All you're doing is missing the point on the other side. The whole point is focus in on him. He may have you go home and just be by yourself all day and open his word and spend time with him. My point is, listen to him. Listen to him. Don't go about this day today generically because you decided some schedule in your mind. Let him guide in it because when he fills it and you're connected with him in it, then there'll be all the things that he promised, the joy, the peace, the love. And I'm just so thankful. Alex, come on up. I'm so thankful this idea that he gives in relationship with him, and I am so eager for the bride to get it and come together and be united. Man, that's such a good, such a good reminder. Um, early in what he was saying, I was thinking about Matthew 7. I had actually was weeping with the Lord a couple weeks ago about wide is the gate and, and the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that is the way of the Lord. And, and one of the things the Lord said to me in that moment is it's easy to destroy your life. It's a wide gate, wide path. And, and yet it's such a narrow path to choose him. And, and that made me so sad because I said, Lord Jesus, you are worthy of the wide gate being the gate that leads to you, to life, to Jesus, because you're worthy of all of your creation, human creation to, to worship you. And yet so many hearts can't do it. Um, there's this journey, this thing that many of us have been on, and I think it was Linda that we, we had this conversation briefly a few weeks back. There's this, um, this rec recurring word 
that continues to come into my mind, and it's futile, futility. There's, there's something, ha I'm so thankful for it. Many of us have been on it early on, but where every, we're seeing the futility of the things of this life, just glaringly loud. And I just find that I'm so thankful. The reason I'm so thankful for it is because God is beginning to make it really clear that he wants to be our everything and he is our everything. And, you know, when he released turmoil into the world and, and the woe, by the way, yes, the woe is not for the bride, but the woe is for those who will not seek the Lord and will not choose him. And he, he's making it clear, but yet if, if you're not surrendering, it can be very frustrating because everything you pursue that is not of God, everything that used to be something that made you feel good or made you happy is really coming up empty. It's so interesting. People are either recognizing that it means nothing and finding that they need to go to Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself also in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart, or they will be frustrated and they'll find nothing that's not fun anymore and go to the next fun thing or go to the next project. I have found even movies that I used to enjoy that were good movies are just so empty and bore me because nothing satisfies like the Lord Jesus. It's just a strange, there's something about the entanglements of the things of this life and pursuing anything apart from the Lord's voice and what he's breathing on that is so empty. And I'm just, it's, it's a strange thing, but it really, it really does go to um, what he's doing in these times. And I don't, for sake of time, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I will say this. Everything we know, we've said this so many times, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, right? He said he would shake it. In full transparency, the Lord's been laying on the hearts of different ones in leadership and ignition, things that we can't quite make sense of yet, and it kind of goes to some of the visions that Greg's been having. And that is that what God wants to do to fully solidify this paradigm of, of really what the last verse in Ephesians 2 talks about, which is him wanting in the ecclesia of his bride to become a dwelling place. He wants to embody and become a dwelling place moved by the Spirit of God through our lives. And he's beginning to show us that we are going to be on a very tumultuous road of um, what things look like to do church and to, you know how Hebrews talks about, don't forsake the assembling together. People often refer in their thinking that to be coming to a building and, and getting yourself into a routine. Don't forsake your routine of going to church other than just the, you know, um, CEOs of Christianity, Christmas, Easter, and the other ones that you think are important. Um, but it's this, it's this idea of the church is the body of Christ. And wherever that is, whatever that looks like, he wants to shed all norms of religion. And I have been thinking a lot about that. We had a conversation about it recently, and the Lord's been showing me all different things. Um, we don't know space-wise where we'll be after this, but the Lord is showing us a possibility of a space. And I will tell you what, when the Lord said he was going to start everything in Nigeria, boy, has he, as far as certainly for my personal walk. He, if it wasn't for Nigeria, I wouldn't be prepared for what some of the stuff he's been showing us here in the U.S. that we're going to be doing. And I'm so thankful for that because he showed me that, um, just because I like to wear dresses and stuff like he's shown me that, yes, in Africa with a dress and a hat, I can get into the mud and be covered with these locust-looking <laughs> flies, they were huge termites, all the way up my arms, delivering this little boy, raging with demons, and what I didn't know at the time, just witchcraft, just heavy, and it was like, God just put me there, filled me with his power, and we just, we just did it, and it didn't matter um, what the circumstances were, I couldn't see, it was getting dark, there, I mean, there were bugs everywhere, and it was just like, you just do what you got to do. And the Lord gave me so many of those experiences and said, look, my church is my dwelling place. It is not a building. It is not a nice, crisp, 
nice and neat and tidy sermon, as Greg said at the beginning, so that you can get to your food afterwards. Um, it isn't the perfect music, the, the, the evoking just the right emotion so that somehow the church getting your God on can shake off your rough night because you certainly, you know, you don't know what else to do. If I don't go to church and get rid of this bad mood, I don't know what I'll do. That is not the church's job. You get into the secret place of the Most High. And you get in the presence of God and then come filled with his presence into the body of Christ. And then we share and we fellowship and we spread that into the world. And so these visions that Greg is having, they are not in the far future. Something is happening and I believe it's happening so much sooner. And I'm saying this just because I, I can't make sense of it, but I'm whatever church parameters are in us are about to be shredded and um, otherwise we will be uh, in um, in a place of shrinking back in our faith and what did the Lord say it was pretty harsh but I have no I have no place for you if, if you're going to look back after putting your hand to the plow you know it, it's it's a it, these are the just the times that we're in, and he's helping us. He's helping us get there by making everything else not interesting, not fun. It's like the favorite things we like to taste are losing their taste. They just don't. It's like um, I just I liked this, but it's like what what's the point? I don't get it. it you know, it's like okay, fine. You know, I, I I there's a there are things that he will always allow us to enjoy. But they used to mean everything. And just don't they just mean nothing now? Isn't it interesting? They just kind of are like, thank you, Lord. I'm enjoying it. But it just doesn't have the weight of meaning that it did before. He's unentangling us. And it's a really cool thing. And I'll tell you, if you pursue because you've got to have these things, you will come up empty every single time. And that is a favor and that is a blessing to us. Because if it's important, doesn't mean that he's going to strip away things you enjoy. All things are for your sakes. First Corinthians 4. All things are for your sakes. But if they come before him, what did he start ignition with? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. Well, we're going to go through another time of testing. Everything God, I was listening again this morning to a worship song. Um, I don't know the name of it, but it was, he works all things for your good. And whatever he's about to do, whether it have air conditioning, nice floors, decent chairs, or not... <laughs> It will be for our good. I just know that it will. And, um, and I'm thankful that he gave me so many, I could tell you stories all day long of crazy circumstances and experiences in Nigeria that I am now, God's beginning to go, remember that? Remember that? Remember that? You didn't think you could do it? You didn't think you could handle that? But I got you through, didn't I? You know, you didn't, you, 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 that's not who you are. That's not really your thing. And yet I made it your thing. You didn't have the strength for that physically, but I helped you endure. Your body doesn't do well <laughs> in the heat and in the super long hours and, oh my goodness, long list of other things, but I was your strength and your weakness. And he's been reminding me that, reminding me, and I'm like, thank you, Lord, but what are you trying to say? I think we're just, we're just headed for some very interesting times, just to what Greg said at the end. It's exciting. Be excited. Because I got to tell you, any, any dreams you have, you know, we have, we have young people, we have people with their lives ahead of them, future marriages and, and new families and things ahead. There is no high big dream you could dream for yourself that's bigger than the plans that God has for you. The purposes of God are so huge. And so when you seek him and you put him first, your aspirations in this life are minuscule compared to how God wants to use you in in the indwelling promise that he has for us that's spoken of right in Ephesians for the ecclesia, for those who believe. And that's really where he wants us. And I'm, told, I'm talking to me too. That is where he wants me. And he never ceases to amaze me. Um, when you're out of your comfort zone and things aren't what you expect, God gets to be a new aspect of him, himself, not a new God. He's, he's in his word. He reveals himself, but he gets to be a new experiential part of himself in my life that he wouldn't be able to be if I was constantly in my comfort zone. 
And um, learning his voice is, is a huge part of that. And there's, there's a message that look, God's been putting on my heart. I don't know if it'll be for the ladies or for gifts meeting or what, but it's about the voice of God and hearing that. But, um, but this is a, such a good word and such a good reminder. Um, but, but shake off any, any expectations. We know God has told us to be mobile, and that's why we're getting things in a row. But I got to tell you, even in the process of getting additional equipment and readiness to be mobile, even in those preparations, the Lord has kind of said, yeah, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to allow it, but it really doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, it's weird. It's like he, he loves the excellence and he loves things to be done in, in a way that's, that's excellent. But in the whole scheme of things, he is to be preeminent. Not our sound, not our ability to communicate online, nothing else. And, you know, that's easy easier said than done because when you know he wants excellence and then you're striving for excellence you know you just you just have to trust him I mean it's just a leap of faith every time we set up here wherever we whatever we do but that doesn't mean you throw it out the window um we just each time we exist and live and move and have our being we have to hear him and if he and this has been the motto of ignition from the beginning if he turns a service on its head and says no I'm making a change we will do it and the worship team is so committed to that they will, I mean, they could practice a set all week, and if the Lord says, nope, none of those songs, new songs, doesn't matter you don't know them, trust me, they've done it. We've seen that in action, and it's beautiful, and that's where God wants us to continue to be, but not just leadership. Anybody else that's part of Ignition, come with the expectancy that it may be the very unexpected, and then um, you'll learn a lot about yourself with how easy you go with the flow or how much you may not go with the flow. Um, and, uh, and there's a refinement process when he kind of does that. And I know he's such a great refiner, but let him, let him refine you. He's, he's good. And there are some crazy things in the, in the future for us, but, uh, but God is so good, and he will, he will walk with us through it. And his plans are always better. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God. Thank you that you are God, and there is no other. Thank you that you love us so much. Everything. Everything about our existence in that last song that we got to sing about that's victory for us. Everything goes to the cross and Jesus, what you paid for and the blood that was shed to wash us clean, but to also help us to walk in this overcoming power. Thank you for what you did on the cross, Jesus, and that we serve now a risen Savior, alive and breathing, and speaking to us, and that your word, when you speak through your word, it's because your word points us to you. Your word is what tells us that you speak directly to us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to just let you dwell within us in the way that you speak of in Ephesians, in a way that we can hardly even imagine. And help us to, by faith and surrender, experience the length and breadth and depth and height of your love and be rooted and grounded in it. Because it's a blast to be with you, God. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for what you're doing in Ignition that is so different than I could have ever imagined. But yet, not different than what you want. We just have had a couple thousand years of tradition that Satan's always trying to get us to fall on instead of just you. So God, we just pray that you just give us the strength to just open our arms and let you do everything you desire through us and in us and for us. We give our lives and this, this church, this movement, this ignition to you, God. We love you and we praise you. Thank you for the word that you gave us this morning. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.